Okay. Um, we have got one item which is, uh, I think at this point, do I have to tell everybody, uh, Janet, that there's one item which is an exempt item which will be below the line, which will be coming up right at the very end of the meeting. And if anyone is listening from a member of the public, um, we will have a short pause whilst uh, whilst you're able to disconnect from the meeting uh, while we take the exempt item. Yeah, it's under a certain also, section. Janet can yeah. quote that section for yeah, us, that please. Quote, uh, that that section is in um, item four. Item two is members' interests. If anybody's got any in members' interests to declare, um, sorry, item three is um, is the exemption, and item four is the minutes of the meeting. So, do you want me to quote the the actual section, Chair? I think you better do. Thank you, Janet. Right, okay, if you can just bear with me, I'll just get the uh, I'll just get the agenda up myself. I found it so I can quote right. it myself. Okay, right, okay, that's fine. So we're open to the public uh, except that under section 100 a um, paragraph 4 of the Local Government Act 1972 it is recommended that the public be excluded from the following item of business on the grounds that it involves the likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in the state at paragraph part 1 of schedule 12a of the Act, namely item a paragraph 3 financial and business affairs. Okay. Right. Can we go on to the minutes of the meeting held on the 16th of January? Is everybody happy that those minutes are a correct record from that meeting? Of those people that were present? Councillor Bradbury, yes, you're happy? Yeah, so I said, yeah. Yeah. Um, Councillor Holden, are you, are you not in a position to be able to put yourself on, on, on um, video? I'm not at the okay. moment, Chair, um, but I am happy with the Okay, minutes. thank you very much. Yeah, right. Yeah, I've had Okay, a, I've had John, a... have you something you want to add? I was just going to say... We're, you were waving counselors. your pen. Both Councillor Swift and Councillor Scullion are trying to get into the meeting, but are finding the link hard. Right, okay. Um, IT will try and assist them in the background. Um, she has, I've, that's what I was just about to say. Councillor Scullion's having difficulties getting in. She's asked us to appoint a chair. So I will, I will let her know that that's what we've done. Okay, are we happy to um, accept those minutes as a correct record? This, uh, Councillor Horden is how it is, and, and I'm myself. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda is um, the communications update. So can I, Lucy, are you going to give us um, an update on communications? I think we've all been sent um, a, a, a report, but would you want to add any more to that? Um, I think the main thing that I would say is obviously it's been through some, we've all been through some very difficult times since our last meeting. Um, throughout the lockdown, we were pushing messages around um, the elements of the market that were still open because if you remember um, Councillor Carter and I had a conversation actually in those early days where there were food shortages and it was an opportunity to highlight which of the um, stalls in the market were still open and we made sure that the website was updated with that and put out social media messages. The report isn't as we normally provide it just because the comms team is simply focusing on COVID and the response to that at the moment, but where we can fit the market into that, because it's a valuable, off, still offering valuable services to the community, we are still pushing that and hopefully you see that throughout the report. A lot of the report also mentions what we aim to be doing once um, the local restrictions are lifted somewhat. So that work is still underway. It's It started and then it's briefly paused. But as soon as we can get back onto that, um, we will do. For example, I know Karen's listed photography in particular as something that we want to be out and about get, capturing that and then using it through all our We can't, we can't hear you. Uh, um, channels to continue promoting the market. The other thing oh. is promote it. Sans provided us. Sorry, was that? Did I miss something? Yeah, you, we could. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes, Lucy, you keep coming and going. In fact, you've gone now. I've taken myself off the film, so maybe the bandwidth will help me speak. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Yes, we can. Brilliant. Okay. So apologies. Um, I know these are very trying times, um, but hopefully you get a feel that we haven't forgotten about the markets. We're doing all we can in the present circumstances and we've got plans for when the restrictions are starting to lift to start pushing again, both in terms of the trader campaign and also promoting the market to consumers as well. I'll pause there and uh, take questions if you have any. Um, just from my perspective, Lucy, are you staying for the whole of the meeting? Yes, I can do if you want me to. Because I think when we've, I don't want to jump the report, I don't want to jump John's report to item six, because I think some of, some of the things in his report actually can be quite relevant to communication. So I just wonder, could you be available for when we do item six so that we, you could possibly answer any issues that we've got about communications in the light of John's report. I know that sounds a bit convoluted, but. <laughs> yes, that's fine, I'll stay on the line. Thank you very much for that. Right, um, anybody got any questions, Councillor Holden, have you any questions? No, none at present, Chair. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bragber is not indicating either. Okay, Lucy, thanks very much for that. I mean, I think we all understand the difficulties at this time with uh, everybody working from home. Um, I guess the markets is one of the, the bits of the council that's the publicly, that public see. So I guess it is one of the more important elements of the work that we're doing at the minute. Um, but thank you for that report. Thank okay. Um, are we any nearer, Janet, on Councillor Scullion and Councillor Swift? Uh, no, um, t I've I've asked I've asked Tilly to see if um, Matthew can assist from IT to get Councillor Scullion in, and okay. I'll I will get um, get them to add Councillor Swift as well. Okay, thank you for yeah. that. Right, um, the next item is the market up update. We've got the written reports with uh, six and six A. Um, so, John, are you leading this? John, are you leading on this? And is um, I'm just Alan, to right? And is Alan going to comment if if and when he feels it's necessary? I'm happy to yes, come yeah. and join if that's <laughs> It's like Thank waiting you. for Christmas in this, I <laughs> You don't know what's going to happen next. Um, right. Oh, dear me. Okay. Right, John, over to you. Well, as Lucy alluded to, you mean, these have been very testing times and the market service has been no real exception, really, if I'm honest. But the major test was for, for obviously, the traders. Because, incidentally, most of the traders were basically shut down, unable to trade, and therefore big chunks of their income gone and big old within our markets really. Um, we instantly had to close the car boot sales due to the fact that we were, and we still are to this, this, this moment in time. Um, we're not confident we could socially distance it properly with the touching of products and sharing of products. It was very difficult, particularly when there was no government guidelines on incubation and of products at that time. Now it would affect certain certain things that were touched. So we instantly suspended those events, and they are currently still evended, uh, suspended. That instantly removed 370 sellers from the council's portfolio. So you can imagine it had a major impact on the service. Um, again, with all the layouts of the various markets, because. As you know, Chair, being the NABBA representative, no market was ever designed for social distancing. They were always designed for social inclusion. And so it was exceedingly difficult in having to replan out the layouts, secure traders' stalls that weren't trading, particularly the market halls. But we managed to get there. Uh, and so we continued trading through various markets. And what I've tried to do within the report is give a, a brief update on um, each individual market and 
aims and objectives of where we might need to go going forward. And obviously members may have some further suggestions or further requirements to add to that as we go along. But at this moment in time, the service is struggling financially. I can't, I can't allude from that. We, are, we have around about 150K shortfall on the budget in regards to lost income. And so it's a, a very difficult scenario for all really. Um, but as we go through, I think it, it's difficult because obviously item eight on the agenda is um, the borough market and that is exempt. And initially that was part one of my uh, report. But before I go into that, we have been very well supported by the National Association of British Market Authorities, of which we've been a member for a very long, long time. And of course, you know that chair being the current president. Um, but since March, they were suggesting that only 22% of markets had any trading taking place at all in the entire country. Now, there are four, allegedly in the region of 14 to 1,500 markets in this country. So you can, you can imagine the significance that that had. Footfall had decreased by between 80 and 90% at each of those markets. And 35% of the operators were suggesting that they may never, ever trade again. So again, as we step through into our own markets, the picture on a national front was looking very, very bleak. But we did manage to sustain operation in all six towns throughout the borough. So the borough market in Halifax continued to trade with a small offering of around 20%. And that took in all our food vendors, butchers, uh, and we, could, we, it, we were able to place pet food products into that. And the traders reacted relatively well, if I'm honest, because most of them, whilst they took no, very little notice of what we were suggesting previously, they've reacted through the pandemic in introducing card, cashless payments, delivery systems, um, and improved communications of their own businesses. So again, it, it made an improvement overall. In conjunction with the um, tenants associations, and at both market halls to an extent, we negotiated reduced opening hours for safety purposes and enable us to clean down, give us longer time to keep areas clean and sanitised. But this also reduced the visitors from round about 13,000 a day to one and a half thousand. So you can, you can understand the impact that the traders had instantly. We've now obviously opened a lot of those businesses. In fact, we're, all, we're almost... 100% open now. We've got two that aren't currently trading due to the fact they're close contact um, services. And footfall's risen to about 5,000 a day, which again is only around about a third of the footfall that we normally get. Out of those traders, only one trader has not accessed any SBGF grant funding whatsoever. So unlike the council, where we've not been able to access any government funding, there has been some access to financial support to traders. Rental collections have been suspended and they are proceeding to a digital invoicing. But unfortunately, due to staffing resource issues within the service, those invoices have not yet been raised and due to division of duties. And subsequently, when we do raise those invoices, when the team member comes back or we get additional resources, there will be a significant further impact on the traders' financial demands. Coming out of the, the pandemic, um, four traders have served notice on the council. That has therefore reduced overall occupancy to the borough market by the end of next month to 75%, which as members know, I've worked for the council a long time. That is the lowest occupancy we have ever witnessed within the borough market in its entire history. And again, that is alluded to uh, on a separate report re regarding the borough market. So as you can see from the report, the actions that I am suggesting is that we continue with the building improvements and other issues that will be discussed within the report. Topping markets, almost a third of the traders were able to continue trading due to the fact that the majority of the traders there are all full traders. Um, and only ten, but only 10% on the external market were permitted to trade under the government restrictions, which means that we lost another 170 traders from Tobedin. 
But the Traders Association were quite on top of this and joined forces with the open market, which I think is relatively unique within the industry, uh, and used the Shop Happy flat platform to undertake deliveries throughout the borough, and particularly the Calder Valley. Uh, and that's been relatively successful because talking to um, Cargo Dale, who've been doing the delivery, a lot of the deliveries, over 2,000 deliveries were taken within a space of nine weeks. So again, that's really <coughs> well. Um, footfall has returned slightly as traders have come back uh, and majority of, uh, are doing relatively well. We've maintained the social distancing measures within top of the market all. Uh, however, we did have some issues with the Thursday market on the outside uh, due to people not considering our social distancing requirements. And so we had to suspend that market uh, for a number of weeks until we could put in one-way systems and procure additional fencing uh, and other issues so that we could be more confident in delivering it. And subsequently, since that time, uh, we have relaunched that market and it is now 60% occupied. The good thing about the open market is that we've seen an increase on every single operational day and occupancy at this moment in time on the open markets at Chobbardin has seen a 20% increase. So what we're saying that we need to do going forward with Chobbardin, particularly the market hall, in first instance, is review the occupancy agreements, which we've already got targeted, but it is of a, the opinion that no trader will sign the draft agreement now we've had a pandemic. They will want clauses included within any future agreements that include potential close down for a pandemic. We need to continue to monitor the footfall, make sure it's safe and that capacity levels are constantly monitored and negotiate the new lettings on the three vacant units that we've got applicants for and then further progress the delivery system because what we're looking at doing as a council is introducing a cargo bike delivery service from each of the towns. And so we are, look, we are in conversations at this moment in time with Totally Locally on how we can use the Totally Locally platform for all the council's markets. And of course, one of our businesses at the market all that was impacted upon was the bar that we recently introduced under a, a private license. And we've decided that what we need to do going forward for the market all is obtain a premise license um, to facilitate opening into the evening and provide provision of entertainment. The uh, mar open market, uh, we need to look at layouts. And again, the council will know, our councillors will know that there has been talk of the future towns fund. Um, and so the market will play heavily into that layout of Bram Square area from Rose Street, which will be discussed presumably at the Chobbardin Development Board. Sobe Bridge Market, members will note from previous meetings um, that we had um, discussed a plan under the historic high streets um, in regards to the development of the Sobe Bridge connection to the canal and Wharf Street and traffic measures there. That was submitted to Cabinet on the 6th of July, and it was approved that the market be demolished, subject to termination of the occupancy agreements uh, within budgets. However, the market has continued to trade throughout the pandemic, and we have seen a 30% increase on occupancy of open market stalls. The only problem with Sorby Bridge is that we do not get to keep those traders. And so for officers, the actions required are to commence termination of the tenancies. But I would also wish to seek members' advice on what their thoughts are in regards to reusing some of the materials used within um, the construction of Sorby Bridge elsewhere within the council's market's portfolio. And if I could break their chair for those comments, it would be much appreciated. Yeah, Councillor Blackborough. 
Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, it, I guess it relates to the big house market, I guess. So are you thinking about using some of the things in the big house market? Um, I, have, I have some other questions about the big house market, but that's my, my initial thoughts. So I'm, I'm putting first, uh, first grabs. <laughs> Oh, exactly, and that's what I was thinking, Council Dagmo, was that, <laughs> all right, we've got an estimate on the demolition, which obviously reusing the equipment would possibly put that price up, but the market was constructed as a bolt-together market, and so it could have quite easily been... Dismantled. Even the roofing panels reused for potentially on the lock-up units at Big House. Um, the stalls potentially re-erected uh, if needed, but I'm also concerned, I don't know how Alan thinks about this, but there are around about 45% of the roof space at Sorby Bridge covered with photovoltaic cells that generate its own solar energy. And I don't think they should necessarily be lost to the council in a carte blanche demolition, if I'm honest. And I just like... Oh, you've, ju you've jumped in there, Jan Walker, and stolen my <laughs> thunder. Because nobody else but you and me had know that there were photovoltaic cells in that in those roofs, and and you can actually look at how much electricity has been generated on a thing within the market at any time. So I was going to say that when uh, when members had had a chance to talk, but anyway, you've stolen me thunder. Go on, carry on. <laughs> That's just basically getting a, a gathering of members' opinions, really. For those of you who don't know, it, it, it is it. It's worth going to have a look at because it was one of the agreements that they would try to make the market down in Sobey Bridge as green as possible and generate its own electricity, which it does. And then it has this thing that you can you can read to see how much electricity has been generated. And at some point in time, I don't know that we still do, but initially we did used to sell that back to the um, electricity companies. Do we still sell some back, John? Um, that, unfortunately, I can't comment on that because um, that all electricity bills for premises are picked up by Allen Service. Yeah. 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 So we don't know how well, yeah, it's something worth looking at, but that is something that we were able to do with that. I have to so totally agree with Councillor Blackberry. If anything is, is reusable, I think, looking at Allen uh, as well, if anything is reusable, then I think we should reuse it, especially with the position that we're in in Brighouse because surely it'll be cheaper to reuse that stuff from Sobe Bridge than it will to buy a whole load of new stuff for Brighouse, mm. if, depending on what the outcome is for Brighouse. But we could actually improve some of the other market areas that we've got by using that gear, I would have thought. But I'm, obviously I'm not a construction engineer, so I'm not so sure. Councillor Holden. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been it's been a grim six months, hasn't it? You know, and it, it's obviously had a massive massive effect. Um, one thing I would I would just mention whilst we were talking about Sobby Ridge, keep that thread going. Um, if we do reuse the uh, the parts at uh, Brighouse, can we make sure that the roofs fitted correctly this time? Oh, uh, that was below the belt. Well. <laughs> It's a it's a point worth making, Councillor Carter. Absolutely. <laughs> so if if we could just make a note of that, Alan, when uh, if if that if that happens, um, let's so... make sure with no staff still in post in, <laughs> in architects that were there then. Oops. <laughs> um, but obviously we're 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 still at a time where we're we're in a partial lockdown. Um. Um, and we're still facing some quite hefty challenges in Calderdale. Um, are we are we utilising this time now so that we're coming right out of the starting blocks post post COVID or post lockdown? Because you know, and, and really, and apologies for being be, being late to uh, the full meeting. Um, but really, this is this is time that we should be utilising both in comms and in the market service to be making sure that we're fully fully ready, um, you know, trying to encourage new traders to uh, take an interest, et cetera. So what, what are we doing from that point of view, John? Can I just interrupt and ask that? John said he was pausing after the Sober Bridge about the demolition stuff. Is there some more within the report, John, that you'd like to go through before you answer 
that question from Councillor Holden. Um, yeah, I could look. I could, I could, could because what you'll find when I go through the the further markets is a growth in occupancy. Um, and so it may be that we continue the thread through the other markets and then I can allude to some of that. Okay. Councillor Clark, did you want to ask a question? Yes, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, new to markets working party, so uh, excuse me if I'm illiterate about it all. Um, Sobby Bridge Market, I know it's a fixed market at the moment. Will there not be an open market in the end? The intentions, Councillor Clark, are that there will be a, shall we say, for want of a better word, a town square built within the space. Yeah. It will be stepped from Wharf Street up onto a flattest part of land. They can't totally get out of the, the slope of the land. Yeah. Uh, but there will be some nice coloured paving with a, a, a sympathetic... Where nice the car is now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And so we will then be looking to old um, temporary market structures there and we've already requested the required uh, electrical supplies go into the, the floor surfaces so even if we don't use them there are sufficient supplies there for the community to be able to use for festivals etc um, but the intention is that we would potentially um, post-covid of course um, launch our evening markets from Sorby Bridge. Excellent, thank you. I was a bit worried that my, uh, Sobby Bridge was going to left without anything really, but... Can I, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to there. I think the council, what we've got to consider is that the markets obviously are not a charity, they are a business of the council. And yeah. therefore, the only thing that would restrict us from running there is if it is financially unviable. Yeah. So we've got to make it financially viable, if I'm honest. Yeah, yeah. Thank but you. The, but the stores that are currently there, with it being a fixed structure, could not be utilised because it would need to be um, temporary stores, stores that are put up and down as and when they've been renowned. And that's where so the costs come in. They couldn't we, have managed, we have managed, Council Carter, as you well know, that, you mean, and Council Holder to an extent, that, that we've operated totally locally markets from there where we've increased the occupancy of the market by 150%, which have fund, not only funded themselves, but funded the... Um, introduction of reindeers and Santa Claus at Christmas, where it's, they've, they've been able to financially support themselves. So if it's done periodically on a reasonable size scale, it can't be done on a scale of 10 to 20 stalls. It's got to be 20 stalls beyond. So it will be some size market. And it will mean that the, the market service has to take over the entire space to facilitate that financial viability. We won't talk about Father Christmas. It's getting very grumpy. Right. Um, for one of a better, well, for those that don't know, Father Christmas was um, Councillor Carter's husband, and, and she was his little. <laughs> it gets a very grumpy Father Christmas now. He's getting very old and grumpy, and this lockdown doesn't help. Uh, right. Um, do you want to carry on then, John? Has anybody anything else they want to add to Sobey Bridge about utilising, reutilising the, the whatever is available? Uh, can I just ask before we move on to that, Alan, can we do that? You haven't said whether it's feasible or not or whether it would be difficult or whatever. Uh, I think what we can commit to is to, to kind of look at what's available, technically appraise it and financially appraise it um, and see what can be reused. Certainly we can commit to doing that. Okay, right. Councillor Holden. Thanks, Chair. Um, can you just remind me what sort of time frame are we looking at Sobey Bridge being without a market? Realistically. Unfortunately, I can't answer that because obviously it's not, it's a transportation scheme and not a markets or a CAFM scheme. Mm. So we've not got any project plans upon that scheme. We don't, uh, it's Mary Farris scheme really. But they've not dialed you into any any conversations regarding their their sort of time frames. I've not I'm not familiar with any time frames in regards to that scheme. Can I ask if I'm am I be, am I being a bit pedantic if I ask at this point then? Do you think it might be useful if we knew what the timescales are sort of looking at? Because surely there's little point in giving stall orders terminations. Um for a date that 
that then the market could still be operating for another six months or are you wanting not to bother with that or whatever? I mean, the, the only one I'm thinking of in particular is is obviously the, the, the cafe because it has got a very viable business. Well, are we looking to give them a, um, a notice to quit or are we looking to keep them going as long as we can? That, that's the only reason why I'm asking that question. The stance chair is that all traders will be served notice of termination un under the Landlord and Tenant Act. Now, that means that we've got to do it in a prescribed form over a prescribed duration. Now, that duration could be anything between six to 12 months. Now, the Bridgetown Board have suggested and are currently exploring how the cafe could potentially be, because the cafe is quite important to Sobby Bridge. It acts as a social hub. Um, they're potentially, at this moment in time, exploring the use of the toilet area uh, and how that toilet block could potentially be used for both a toilet and a cafe. And so there's still some work to go on that. But once we've declared a market to be closed, you're doing it a detrimental service to an extent in keeping it going because people tend to walk away from it and move away. And so we would be looking, from a services point of view, once notice of terminations and we've got to get his head around this, I have to say that, because normal business tenancies would be reviewed under the Landlord and Tenant Act under six, I think there's seven different principles of which two of them come into play here. Now, they come on a compensation factor. And um, the compensation factor is based around a bit rateable value. But the rateable value for Sorby Bridge is on the market, not on individual premises. So we still have to come to some form of conclusion how that compensation for surrendering their occupants there can be, can be achieved. So there'll be some negotiations to go through with each of the traders within the secure units. Okay. Um, does that answer anybody's questions? Councillor Horden, did you want to ask something? Did I see you put your hand up? No, no, I'm fine, Chair. That's um, what what would be good though is is if we could get a steer for the next for the next meeting as to as to yeah. estimated timescales from Mary Farrah's team. Yeah. Uh, I think it's I think it's vital because it does impact upon upon decisions that we make here. I've already written that down, Chair, and I'll, I'll pursue that for members. And I think at this current moment in time, when when we've got this COVID situation, the last thing we want to see happening is looking as though um, we're leaving uh, Sobey Bridge to sink into oblivion. I mean, that, you know, that, that is not what we should be seen to be doing by just going ahead and pulling it when it could be months down the line because whether it's our funding or, or combined authority funding, it still doesn't look very good. Um, if, you, if that is the situation, it doesn't look good for the, for the, uh, for the town, it doesn't look good for the councils. Right, Councillor Scullion, uh, do you wish to take over the chair? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carter, very much for stepping in. Um, I, I tried to watch you on YouTube for a bit, um, and I understand that Councillor, the same bug has hit Councillor Megan Swift, um, and they're trying to sort her out as well, but it's a torturous business, um, really, really hard to, hard to do. Um, the system took against me entirely, but thank you very much for stepping in. Um, do I understand that we have dealt with the communications update and that we're now on to the markets update? Councillor Scullion, we've gone through, item, we've up to item six, we've gone through it um, to the end of 4.4 in 6A in the report, where John then just stopped so, so that we could comment on anything to where we were up to that point point it's now looking at going to Matteland at 4.5 on page six um but i just wanted to say thank you for um uh, it's been a bit different sharing that meeting on on uh, zoom i have to say and uh, i guess there might be only me knows or alan might know um john got his diary all muddled up which is yeah okay we can all manage to do that in COVID times and he's currently in a field in shropshire in his tent so well, thank him very much for taking the <laughs> afternoon off to join us in a meeting when he's uh, when he's absolutely on leave. And let's just hope that thunder and lightning and uh, floods don't happen while he's still, while he's out there, John. Thank you. Well, everybody. thank you, and 
Thank you, Geraldine. And, and thank you, John. The, I was going to say at the beginning of the meeting, um, I was going to say thank you really to all the staff for what has been a very, very difficult and challenging time. And thank you to all the traders who've, you know, in different ways got us to where we are now. It has not been easy, not been easy for anyone. So we're at um, 4.5 on page six. And I think you were just concluding the discussion on Surbury Bridge Open Market. And I heard, heard some of those points and they'll be in the minutes as well. Shall we move on to Elland Open Market then, John, please? Uh, thank you, Jess. Um, as members will be aware, we uh, we approved you approved the relocation of Elland Market last year due to the fact that obviously it had reduced down to two traders, and that uh, subsequently we re relocated that to the former site at uh, what was named as Town Hall Square. Um, had a subsequent small growth up to the breakout of the lockdown, uh, and it again was reduced to two traders, largely selling fish bread and confectionery. But again, on the 15th, when um, the ice streets were re-unlocked, re a further eight traders joined, rejoined us back. And subsequently, since then, the market is now fully fully operating on all stalls, 100% occupied. Excellent. Now, when I say all stalls, that means we're current, well, when I wrote the report, we were only operating off 14 stalls um, due to the fact we were wanting to maintain adequate social distancing. Um, we've managed to be able to sneak out to 16, and we are we now have a waiting list of another four to five traders wanting to do Elland. So out of the pandemic, Elland has resurged back stronger than it ever was. And it's nice to see that a lot of local businesses are starting to use the market. And that would tie in quite neatly to the future High Street Fund bid that the council submitted to government if we'd be, be successful in creating the marketplace there uh, and, and would therefore substantiate substantial growth within Elland as a town. Mm. So if anyone wants to comment on that before I move on to Ebden Bridge, I can break off if you wish. Anything particular to mention about Elland members? No, move on to Hebden Bridge then, John, because I, I know we've had some COVID security issues there that you've had to deal with, but generally a positive story. Well, initially, you mean, again, I alluded to this at the opening, it was that we had concerns over second-hand markets in, in the fact that there was very little guidance coming out of government at the time in regards to how the pandemic was transmitted. Mm -hmm. We considered that the handling of products, particularly on second-hand markets, where you don't go for a purpose, you go for a browse, would, would, would exasperate potential spread. So we cancelled all... Um, second hand markets and then on lockdown we obviously closed down the ca the craft market with it being non-essential but we managed to maintain 50 percent occupancy at ebden bridge due to the fact that the thursday and sunday markets are largely all food oriented yeah. and the only reason why we'd reduced to that level if i'm honest is that several of the traders were shielding themselves and we did not want to stand in those initial periods. Mm. But from the 15th of June onwards, the market has re researched back, both on Fridays, where we can manage it, and on Saturdays, and we are now 100% occupied, more or less, on all four operational days at Ebden Bridge. Um, we did leave the stalls in place, um, because from for our own staff safety, really, to be honest, the, the access into the store is very limited. Um, we couldn't adequately social distance and maintain safety of the stalls, never mind putting them away. Um, the only downturn to that is that we've had a bit of antisocial behaviour, mm. which our safety team are, are looking at, uh, and so too are the police, because people were using it as a, a congregation point on an evening. Um, but we've also had suggestions that whilst we've got the stalls in place, should we not use them more? And so I had a discussion with the car park manager and she would quite gladly permit us to use that more days if we, we required to do so. But then we would need to look at how we prevent that antisocial behaviour going on. So I'd just like to stop it there, Chair, if I may, and, and get members' comments on that one, please. Anything on the Hebden Bridge market? 
certainly one of the things that people said to me was that um, you did get the hang of social distance queuing and got a grip of that um, and that they did feel safe going there. I think the other thing is people commented on the local food supply and the local fresh food chain and how important markets were to that. And I think it's a very good illustration, actually, of people who were not travelling any distance found that they could walk or cycle or just very, very short car journey uh, to pick up food and that it was local, it was there. People were fantastically grateful for that. Just an anecdotal point on that, Chair. I mean, we, the, the community had been very good there. The community in Ebden Bridge had been exceptional. They, they've assisted us wherever we possibly could. And to an extent, you know, when we turned up one morning at half past six, and we had a queue all the way down to St Paul's car park just for the fishmonger, all two yes. metre distance <laughs> themselves. So, I mean, that just shows you how committed they were to using the market. Yeah. It was a bit of a complication when um, Bakehouse, I think it's the Bakehouse, came back with the bread. And we had to put extra gating systems in. But overall, <laughs> so Ebden Bridge has been well occupied, well attended by the public, uh, and, it, and it's felt safe. Yeah, that, that's certainly what people said. I, I'm amused by the idea of small bread riots in in Hebden Bridge. Yeah. Um, Councillor Holden, were you raising your hand? I, w I was, Chair. Um, yeah, I have to say I've, I've driven past both Hebden Bridge and Todmorden Markets and and the way that people have conducted themselves, customers have co conducted themselves regarding social distancing. Um, in fact, I passed, I think I passed the Todmorden market one day and I thought, what the hell are they all queuing? You know, why, why are they queuing around the block? And it turned out it was for the fish store. Um, and it, it, but they are, you know, on the whole, I think, I think, you know, the markets are, are quite well, well managed and well, 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 definitely well managed, but quite well behaved as well from a customer point of view. So, so yeah, I've I've not spotted any any major points of concern throughout throughout the last three months, really. Thank you. Shall we move on to Brighouse then, John? Because as I know that Councillor Blackburn in particular wanted a bit of a discussion. Now it is in your second set of reports, six A, um, uh, but I think perhaps we have a bit of a discussion about Brighouse. Um, Councillor Carter, you raised your hand. Do you want to just say something about Hebden Bridge? Uh, you're on mute at the moment. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I remember, yeah. Um, it's not just Hebden Bridge. I think at this point I was going to say something about all of them. I mean, Brighouse just come into it as well. Um, I, I've, I've no personal experience of what has been going on uh, by going and looking. I have been completely bereft. I have never, ever in the whole of my life spent so many weeks away from a market. And that is a sad comment, but nevertheless, it is fact. And I haven't been anywhere and keep getting told by my daughters I'm not allowed to go anywhere. But I think it's important to recognise in among all this just how important markets are to communities. When you look at the smaller conurbations, I think Halifax is extremely important as well, but I, I don't want to discuss that at this point because obviously there is the exempt report coming up. But I think, I think if one thing has happened in COVID, it has helped us to keep the markets operational, not just here in Calderdale, but Calderdale has done actually better than a lot of the country, um, and keep markets going and how important they, how much more important they've become to communities. And I, just wanted to know really since we lived since lockdown was lifted but I know it's gone partially back but since lockdown has been lifted has the people attending the markets reduced as their footfall significantly reduced it's difficult to, it's difficult to say that yeah because we don't count footfall anywhere but the borough market but if your occupancy is increasing to the levels that we've seen and on, on average across the board our open markets have seen a 20 percent increase at each venue so that would that would substantiate that the bar, open markets are getting the footfall mm. and i were down at brig house um because what i've been doing is splitting my time between sites uh and i spent a full day down at brig house the other saturday and it was very being very well supported by the community mm. Ebden bridge likewise um, Chobbardin, 
Scouser Holding's already alluded to, and Ebden Bridge is just Ebden Bridge. It's always well supported by the community. The success story, of course, is Ellen's. When you consider where you were to where we were to where we are now, mm. but it is that community feel, and what it suggests is that people aren't moving far from their own community, yeah. and they are seeing that supporting that local economy is quite important. And I think that's why we're seeing a little bit of success, if I'm honest. Mm. Thank you, John. I think Councillor Carter is right, though, that actually <coughs> this, these these next few weeks, perhaps when we're out of our, our re extra restrictions period, which let's hope is going to be soon, um, it'd be interesting to just get a sense of the footfall in each of those, whether the um, increases have been sustained, people, whether people have developed those shopping habits and keep them. I think there are a number of things that are in our favour, as, as John said, in terms of what's happening happened during lockdown. I think also, and it, it comes later in the papers, really, in terms of thinking about recruitment, and I think you touched on it in the communications paper, um, that as young people find that the careers or the apprenticeships that they thought they were going to go into, their jobs aren't there, I think we will find an increase in people wanting to try setting up their own business. And in many ways, a market stall is one of the ways that you can try a business and, and make a future really. So it'd be interesting to watch over the next few weeks in terms of whether shopping patterns remain committed to markets, and I really hope they do. And also whether in terms of recruiting new stall holders, and indeed, as we've touched on before, younger stall holders, whether we will see that trend continue. There's no doubt that one of the things I think we've learned from lockdown is about the importance of food, the food supply chain, local food. We're definitely getting customers because of that emphasis on food. But I think we can we can grow from there. Can we move on members then to Brighouse? John, do you want to give us just a few words on Brighouse and then I'll, I'll open up for discussion on that market? Um, so obviously, as your members are, uh, are aware, we, um, I don't know what's going on with my screen at the moment, I do apologise. Um, members will be aware, obviously, we took, we, Brick House Market was a new acquisition um, taken back last year. Uh, the one good thing about taking back Brick House was a core of traders, because that's all the were. The, the, the premises are del heavily dilapidated, they've been unkempt for years fully maintained by the previous operator. But he did leave us behind a fishmonger, a butcher, a baker. The only thing we need now is a candlestick maker. <laughs> but um, altogether, that helped to create a base throughout the pandemic. And particularly with the fishmonger, because Brighouse is a bit bereft with fish. And so the fishmonger brings a little bit of extra pull, shall we say. Then with him, with a butcher being occupied next to him, um, they were very well supported throughout the pandemic, as was the cafe, who went into a local delivery system for his bread and his cakes. And so Brighouse has suddenly sort of emerged, shall we say. Now, it's emerged to an extent in the wrong way. Saturday market has increased occupancy by about 40%. But it's we, we put that down to the fact that we cancelled the car boot sale. The former, we continue to let the market operate like the former market operator did, having second hand on Saturdays. The plan from the council really was not to have second hand on a Saturday. And it might mean that when we have to consider that looking at the car boot sales, we look at the site at Brighouse rather than a car boot sale and introduce an additional operational day just for second hand products. <laughs> and I don't know what Councillor Blackburn's feelings are on that. I, I, I think there's a general discussion at Town Board, but I'll leave it to, to Howard to um, come back on that. <laughs> Howard. Yeah, th th thank you, Joan. First of all, thank you for all the hard work that you've done on the big house market. It, it's, you know, I drove past and I have actually been myself. It's, it's like, oh, right. uh, during this period and, and bought uh, fresh uh, produce, which is, it, it, you can see a, a, a big difference. Um, I don't know if you want to discuss the, the costings at this stage um, uh, to, to go on to those, because I think it's quite, uh, it, it's quite, uh, you know, obvious that we need to move on uh, and remove these stalls and make the, the, the place look, you know, half decent, despite the, the, the extra 
uh, bigger plan, I guess, in some way. So the short term plan, in my in our view, is is really to to make the the markets even more habitable, uh, uh, more accessible, and more open. Uh, the longer term is clearly part of the the town board uh, uh, funds. Uh, in, in some ways. What, what I do want some clarification from, and, and this may be you, Councillor Spillian, is the, the town board monies that was there, do they still exist? And and if so, this, this money that it, there's been estimated for the removal of the open market stalls, it should, the intention was that money was going to be used for that, for that, from, from that pot of money, if that makes sense, rather than the new town's fund grant. So that's a separate entity, it's just as, for some clarification, really. Right. Uh, thank you, Councillor Blackborough. Um, as far as I'm aware, um, that situation is the one that still stands. And that is the decision of the town board to, to recommend to myself as portfolio holder in terms of the formalities, but um, that that money can still be spent on that if the town board agree. Um, but I'll check because it does depend on what else you've spent your money on. So I'll just check. Um, uh, with Mark Cole, the, the amounts and um, confirm that for you. Just come, come back in relation to um, the, the comment in relation to the um, um, the car boot one, I guess, and the second hands uh, and markets is it, perhaps one for further discussion, I guess, in, in some ways. I know I've had a few emails over the last few weeks uh, as to uh, when is it going to reopen or when the car, when is the car boot sale going to reopen. The, the, longer, the, the longer situation there, of course, is that Inevitably, at some stage in the future, we may have to uh, relook at the car boot sale anyway, because it's it's being formed as part of the local plan and and uh, and development. So it's something that we need to to consider anyway. So that this may be the appropriate time to actually say, well, actually, let's let's do something so we appease the the car boot uh, people as 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 well. Whether it's a different day that they use the market for for, for that for that particular uh, uh, element, rather than you know, let's keep the Saturday to a you know fruit and veg, you know fish. Uh, yeah, the butchery and things like that, really. I think those are those are points that um, the town board will have strong views on. In terms of car boot sales for the whole of Calderdale, we're in the government's hands, really, or we're in all our hands in terms of trying to bring the level of the virus down um, to a safe level. And of course, there is a particular difficulty with COVID-19, as far as I understand it, with the science at the moment, being transmitted um, through touching objects immediately after somebody who has the virus has touched them. So trying to make a car boot sale COVID secure, I think at the moment is unthinkable. So we're very much in the hands of the government and, and the people of Calderdale, really. Um, but on the other hand, there are lots of good things about car boot sales, not just the people who get treasures for the Antiques Roadshow, but also it fits in terms of recycling, reusing, um, passing things on, and we've all become much more aware of that. So I don't think we should say no more car boot sales at this point. I think we should see if the situation in the future with the virus allows us to, to move forward on that. But I will pick up that point about, about the money, the original money that the town boards had. Thank you. Um, John, anything else to say on um, a brick house? Uh, just just to, aside from what Councillor Bagber said there was that obviously the town board last meeting I attended I think was February mm -hmm. and we were to go away and acquire uh, estimates for demolition of the open market stalls unfortunately the pandemic slowed some of that work down I can revisit that uh, as we emerge out of a safe into a safest area um, but at the moment um, I'm, I'm going to be hypocritical here. Taking them and them stalls away, we'll lose that extra thirty percent occupancy we've just generated. So we've become a victim of a zone success then, because we don't want them stalls because they look horrible, but now they're being filled. So we're in this situation whereby, and that's the reason why I was suggesting earlier whether we look to use some of the kit from Sorby Bridge and use some of that for open market stalls if it's financially viable. But moving on, Chair, to the car boot sale. Obviously, I mean, my, one of my was one of my earlier roles with the council was to establish car boot sales at the turn of the century, well, turn of the nineties. To be honest with you, they've been very, very successful, very successful over the years. They prove a very good source of financial revenue for the authority. 
And it's still not to be scoffed at. There is a £60,000 income stream on those car boat sales. But we also have some large expenditure, um, particularly through contracted pay, which can't really discuss in an open meeting, um, which we would need to look at. But historically, they peak. They peak between April and the end of maybe August, early September. And then they go into decline until the following March or whatever, when they start to build again. So even if we had some form of COVID safety, it would not be financially viable because the, the income stream would not impact us significantly, whilst the expenditure would take us further down. So we do need to look at how we operate the car boot sale, even now, if we are to continue going forward. And so we will be suggesting potentially, Chair, that we take it, we include this in a report to Cabinet on a review of the markets, that we look at how we take this forward because the contractual payments of staff do not help the financial viability of the car boot sales, if I'm honest. Well, I think, I think we're saying no avenues closed at the moment. Um, moving on your paper, John, I'm conscious of the time. Um, yeah. In terms of the conclusion, and I thought the, the National Association's comments that you put into the paper were, were very helpful in terms of just thinking about the ambience of an indoor market, in particular the hustle, hustle and bustle, and also the online challenge in terms of people having developed during the pandemic habits of um, online shopping. They've also hopefully developed the habits of going to the market and being local. Um, but that's an online challenge that all high streets face um, at the moment. Um, so I think there are a number of things in there and there's a number of things in your next part of your report, I think, that are useful in terms of taking the markets forward. So I wonder, members, if you, with your permission, we move on to the second part of item six, smart 6A in your papers, which is just a, a, a brief district markets update in terms of the open markets and, and other issues. John, be helpful given that it's good paper and there's interesting material in it, uh, but we have covered some of this ground in the first part of the meeting. So I wonder if um, you could take us very quickly through any of the highlights in 6A that you really want to draw our attention to. I think to an yes, extent... Can I just ask a question before we go any further? Thank you. Um, when Lucy gave her report earlier on, on communications, I did suggest could she stay for item six? Um, because I felt that some of the things in item six might have a bearing on, on where we go forward with communication. Um, it is proving to be a success story in the, in the majority of Calderdale as the market position with regards to the outdoor markets. And we are still in what could be termed as a holiday situation uh, with people still um, wanting holidays at this time. I just wonder whether we could have, um, have a think around around a communication strategy to keep up that that shop local element. Um, there is um, something, as, as I, I don't know whether all members have seen it, that's been sent out today, which is to, uh, the shop local campaign um, that, the, that we've been sent out. I don't know who sent it actually, thinking off the top of me. It came out on a member's COVID, I think, and, and it's a shop local campaign. I just wonder whether we could, in, in the light of the demise in some parts of the, the borough on, on the high street, whether we could up that and just have a specific markets campaign um, over in, say, a couple of weeks, just to try and, and get that emphasis keeping going. Um, Lucy, do you want to come back quickly on that before John goes on? Yeah, we can definitely have a look at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Again, Chair, if I may just sort of come in there with, I know that Totally Locally are looking at doing a, a lo shop local campaign as well. The government's campaign did come out via a COVID bulletin this week and a government one later on the back end of last week. It actually started on the 10th and runs for a week, so it's neat almost over. So it might be, as Councillor Carter suggests, of, of an advantage to us to potentially create one. We also need to look at what the National Association uh, will be doing in regards to the um, 
what would have been the Love Your Local Market fortnight back in May, which was suspended, is now mm -hmm. ma called My Market Campaign. And now we can tie both My Market Campaign and Totally Locally's Fiver Fest in October together, really, because there is a prime opportunity to do this in October with, with the Totally Locally's Fiver Fest. Okay, that's a good idea. Um, highlights can from I, your second part of your paper, in, then, John. Can I just come in again up there, Chair, on, just before we share and move on to that one? So this morning, NABMA also produced another document to members in regards to shoppers' confidence. And there is an element here whereby people are not as safe as if people think they or perceive they are in supermarkets. And it said that wherever shoppers go shopping, and Councillor Carter can elaborate further on this, that in unsafe areas, only 57% of those people will return to shop in their areas. Whereas where it's safe, almost all people will return to those shopping environments. So it's how we build on our safety and how we carry that forward. Can I, just, Indeed. Geraldine. can I just update you on that? It's actually a brand new report that's been done by Store Checker. Store Checker is the major major mechanism which is, is used for the high street nationally. And it's an independent company. And they've been doing a survey around around this and it's just come out it's actually only just arrived today. And they're very worrying um gaps in compliance to government guidelines um, and potential health risks. It's, it, it, it's quite, it is quite detailed. What I can do is I can send that to Janet and ask her to send it out to all members because it's worth looking at that people are saying in here that they are not happy going in supermarkets and in ordinary shops because people are not sanitising like they should and they're not wearing face masks and it is a worrying concern. So I will send you that store checker thing as well. Right. And can I also just say on the back of what John was saying about this new NABMA campaign, because we couldn't have Love Your Local Market, that would have been the campaign that, that Visa would have supported. So um, in connection with the High Street, they are now supporting that Love Your Local Market campaign because it's been put on hold this year because it would normally have happened in May. We've been looking as an admin to see how we can support local authorities and, and private operators going forward. And the decision has been taken that we put together a new campaign which is called my market and it, it, it this is going to run now all through next year so it's going to be a big thing running through with the bit that will love your local market will impact on it besides can i suggest that you look at the nabma website i can send you the hyperlink if you like but otherwise just look at the website and that will tell you about the my market campaign because it will be worth getting engaged with that because um, it's just little things, but it, it, the little things sometimes mean mean a lot to people locally, and it will just help maybe the markets and the high street come back a bit. So thank, thank you. Those, thank you those are just much, things Sarah. that I can. I know I've been sending you various bits of information. But very helpful. You can get you can get information overload, but those two elements might be useful for you to look at. Yes, and I, I saw that John John was making a note, note as well. Thank you for that. I think that question of shopper confidence and feeling safe to go back to things um, and to carry on is really, really important in Calderdale. Um, I'm conscious of the time and um, partly my fault for not being able to go, oh, somebody's fault, the system's fault for not being able to get in, in time. And I'm really sorry about that. Um, John, is there anything particular that you want to go through in relation to your 6A part of your district markets report? Well, the six, Chair, the, the 6A report was an appendices to the, to the report that was delivered, really, but it was a report previously submitted to the meeting that couldn't be held because of the COVID outbreak. Um, this, we, I think we've addressed nearly everything in there in regards to all the open markets, bar the detail on costs for Brighouse open market. Yes. Uh, and and, and containing 6A, in, in 6A report on the section of Brighouse Market are some detailed costs in regards to what would be required to deliver Brighouse Market in a reasonable manner, shall we say. And yeah. one of those key things, really, is, is water supplies and drainage. Because we can't continue to try and attract food if we don't have the right necessary mechanisms. 
Um, and as you can see, it was a it's a big bill. Uh, looking at that breakdown at 4.5 in the report. Um, so it's how we look at that and what we wish to put in. Now, the Big House Board originally suggested to the Big House Board it would cost in the region of about 30, 30k. But the Big House Board, to be fair, didn't even bat an eyelid. They just went, we'll come back with some proper estimates and we'll have a look at it. So those are an indication of those estimates. Right, Councillor Blackborough, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, I, I think, yeah, it has come in, like all projects seem to come <laughs> in, there's a, a lot larger amount than what we're expecting in a, a, a bigger shop. How, however, if we're sustained to sustain the market in moving forward, it is, is an investment in some ways. Uh, and if we don't put this investment in now, we, we're not looking long term. People are shopping differently. People are starting to use the, the, you know, the markets. If we want to continue with that, and we want the health and safety of the, and well-being of the uh, of the people that work in the markets, then actually it, this needs to be uh, uh, considered very, very seriously. Yeah, yeah the 120,000 is substantial. Uh, if the town board can certainly, uh, you know, uh, uh, funds, you know, uh, quite, quite a bit of that, and I know uh, Chair, you're going to look into the. Uh, the element of how much money we've got left in the town board, uh, but, but equally, it is it is an investment, and it's people people like it, people like the open space. You know, actually, we you know people feel feel safe. Uh, it's a nice it's a nice flat town, uh, so therefore it is it, definitely uh, it, in my view, uh, as a as a councillor of the big house, uh, worth every uh, every penny. Yeah, I think the environmental health aspects are really, really important there. So let's take a look and see what, apart from the town board, if there are any other funding options there. Anything else in the appendices then, John, that you want to draw attention to? No, not really, Chair, because I think we've addressed most of it through this, this agenda. Right, okay. Um, I think then, I think we're moving on to uh, Councillor Holden. Provision of community markets. You're down as a verbal report, Councillor Holden. Thank you, Chair. I, I wouldn't go as far as a verbal report, but uh, it was uh, it was kind of John to uh, to add this onto the agenda. Um, some time ago, and I'm talking a few years ago, Councillor Mrs. Carter will probably remember, um, where we discussed actually going out into the communities with with markets, open markets. Um, and I actually think if now isn't the time, there never will be a time. Um, we've we've seen an increase in people wanting to both shop locally for local produce. Um, and to give you an example, we have um, the old bridge in, in Rippenden, where there's now for the past six, six seven weeks, um, a fruit and veg sales sales van has, has set up along with uh, one of the local farm shops and they've seen an increase in trade week on week you know there is an appetite for people in some of the communities that aren't serviced by markets um to buy local produce you know and and i think the comments that both yourself and councillor mrs carter made earlier regarding that that requirement for local produce um Bears, bears that out. So I'd, what I'd like to do is bring it back to the table and, and see if there's anything that we can do as a, as a board to, to make recommendations to, to start getting out into the areas such as North Halifax, uh, Rippenden, Storby, you know, some of the, some of the more, more outlying areas that aren't, aren't necessarily serviced by markets. Plus, given the fact that we may be losing Sorby Bridge Market, um, I think I think now is probably an ideal time for us to to seriously look at this. Um, so I'll, I'll open it up to the to the group. Thank you. That's very interesting, and I think it's something we can take a look at. Certainly, as a ward councillor, I've been asked about, as as, as John knows, um, a small number of fruit and veg stalls once a week, um, and in terms of concerns about food security and food poverty, um, of people having to travel, um, people without cars, etc., being able to walk to get fresh fruit and veg, and as you say, in North Halifax and so on. Um, 
and it is something yeah. that we take a look at the models. I don't know if you've um, done any hospital visiting recently, any of you, but um, you will see the fresh fruit and veg at um, both Calderdale Royal and at Huddersfield, and you see the staff and the patients, visitors buying fresh fruit and veg in those stalls. I have been, um, and I'm very well aware of this, been given chapter and verse about markets and competition and um, distancing and uh, and so on. Um, I am very familiar with the charters, um, uh, but I think you're right that this is, is a proper subject for a report for the future. However, we do have to understand that at the moment our market staff are managing within the pandemic, so maybe not the next meeting, maybe it's the, the meeting after that when we're a bit, bit clearer. Any other comments on Councillor Holden's idea? Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to say it's rather, rather than markets, what we found in uh, North Halifax is that um, certain retailers have expanded their businesses, if you like. Um, we have a butcher who is a farm shop, actually, but it's a little butcher's shop. And that, at the beginning of lockdown, sold garden things, everything. It was beautiful. Every, every, everyone went there to get all their garden things, all, all, the, all the plants, all the flowers, everything. And, and of course, it was the butchers. Now, it, it introduced, it, this was outside, and it, it was very socially distanced, and they wiped everything as you touched it. And it, it was excellent. So it wasn't a market. But it was a market stall outside a shop, if, if you know what I mean. It was social distancing. You couldn't go into the shop. Um, so I, I think maybe something like that, which is a bit detrimental to markets. But I cannot see an area in North Halifax where you would have a market. There are no open spaces. Um, th thank you, uh, Mark. Um, Come in there, Chair. Um, I was just about to say, by way of introduction, that um, John has given this thought over the years, um, and he and I have discussed where some possible places might be. Let's hang on to work this up properly, but um, to in, terms, in terms of where, very welcome. Uh, Councillor Carter. But I just tell Councillor Clark that I am a resident of North Halifax, I was born and bred yeah, in North Halifax, and too. know the area backwards. Yeah, I, I just want some clarity, Chair, to be honest. Um, because uh, I guess it's me with so much of a markets hat. Community markets are a, are a designation of a market. Um, like a local authority market, a private operator market, a community market. So there is community markets set up nationally in, in all sorts of areas by a community, by a voluntary organisation, by whatever. That is not being used by our staff. But the issue with that is, as, as you, you should, you're nodding, so I assume that John's told you, the issue with that is charters and, and how many times a year that can happen. And that can only happen, as you are aware, on four occasions in a year when that can work. Now, the only way around that is to change how we operate as a, mark, as a market authority and to change our policies. I think there's... For me, I don't want a report to come back, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm, I don't suppose it's my place to say this, but I don't want a report to come back that sort of only looks at it in part because that, that bit is the most important bit because without that charter and the island market keeping going and without our policy as it stands at the minute, as a local authority, you will then lose the handle on your market, on your markets within your authority. And, I, I just want to make sure that everything we get back in the report covers every aspect so that it's a community market, private operator market, whatever it happens to be and that how the legislation is, is looked at within that is put fully into the, into the report so we know what we're doing. But of course, Councillor Holden, you've got the ideal, you've got the ideal different scenario in Rippenden. You don't actually need that community market in Rippenden, do you? And uh, you might not be aware. But Rippenden Parish Council is a local authority. 
And because it is a local authority, it does have a right, as you know, because I've already done it in the past, to do markets in its area. Now, normally you do it in conjunction with the main authority and you ask their permission if they mind you doing it. But that gets you over the four times a year. But in that case, it has to be the, the parish council that would be the market operator. But that doesn't mean to say that it couldn't ask a professional of some description to come and work for them to put that in, in place. There's ways and means around that one and Rittenden could work with the parish council taking, the, taking over the handle of, of putting that market in the village on a regular basis, on a monthly basis or whatever, under that under its auspices, which would get us out of the four times a year. But um, I am sure, I am more than happy to uh, to, uh, to assist if, uh, if you want. If you want to look at the parish council taking it on, despite the fact I'm no longer there as a parish councillor. Thank you for that, councillor. And uh, the uh, I won't ask John to come back on that. I think we will wait to, to work up and point points absolutely taken. Actually, uh, I notice um, Mr. Lee making notes as well. So um, uh, we will make sure that we we have cognizance of all of these these things. Um, I think we've probably come to the end of that item uh councillor holden thank you very much um and now we are moving to the exempt part of the item where we're talking about um uh financial and business affairs uh which is exempt and i'm going to ask janet as the committee clerk uh to make sure that the youtube feed is uh switched off at this point janet thank you 